Well, it's a privilege and a blessing for me, really. So, yeah. You know, I like that song um, that we just sang. It says, uh, all I need is to know. Well, I'm just paraphrasing. I'm bad at memorizing. I'm, par- I'm good at paraphrasing. Uh, so I'm just paraphrasing. You know, I, 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 all I need to know is that Christ died and that he died for me. Um, and, you know, that comes straight out of the Bible. And it, can, it comes straight out of Romans chapter 8. And Paul's argument is basically, I should turn this on probably. All right. Hello? Yeah. So Paul's argument in Romans chapter 8 basically is, look, Christ already did the hardest thing he can do for you, which is die for you. So why wouldn't he put up with you? You know, we, we, get, doubt, we, we get so doubtful about, you know, oh man, like God can never forgive me or God's got to punish me or God hates me now or no, I can't serve Jesus anymore. It's like Paul's trying to say, hey, wh- what's going to separate you from God and his love when he already gave you the this best thing, the biggest thing, the hardest thing he could give you. He, that's how your relationship with Jesus Christ started, with him dying for you. There's nothing else for him to give. And then Paul says, look, if that's how your relationship with Christ started, how, what's he going to withhold from you? He's going to put up with you. Okay? But, you know, it, it is our job to make it as easy for him as possible, I think. You know. All right. Um, so uh, if you'll turn with me um, to Joshua to start in chapter 24, in the book of Joshua, in your Old Testament. Uh, last year I preached a message here, and, and it was about how we really just have two choices in life. Or, or rather, you know, as you go through life, right, you have to make all these decisions, right, small and big. And, and I basically, the point of the message is that there's two kinds of choices. Okay, there's a lot of different individual choices you can make. But there's two kinds of choices. And it's either the choice for good or the choice for evil, right? Choice for blessings, the choice for curse, uh, the narrow way, the broad way. And that was kind of, I was trying to make it simple, right? Look, you got to choose. You, every time you're making a decision, you're trying to choose between something that's right, maybe multiple options that could all be right, and then a whole bunch of options that are wrong, and really kind of simplify your Christian life in that way. So I want to pick up where we left off um, um, on that, and I want to take us a step further, you know, having made that choice, right? What's next? Uh, I'd like to ask Brother Brian to pray for us before we start. All right, so we're in Joshua chapter 24, and this is kind of where I left off in that last message. And we'll look at verse 14. And so here, you know, Joshua uh, took over the job that Moses had, which was to lead the children of Israel. And they're a picture of God's people. So now church today is kind of like church in the New Testament is kind of an analog, you know, kind of a, an analogy, you know, you, you could say of uh, the the um, Jews in the Old Testament. Now, you don't want to take that too far, but it is a picture. It's a clear lesson to be learned. And, and so Joshua comes kind of to the end of his life here, and he, he and the Jews have been through a lot at this point. They've gone through a lot with the Lord. They've gone astray. They've come back. They've had defeats. They've had victories. And Joshua has led them all this time, right? Um, and he's kind of at the end of his life, And he gathers them all together, and he has one last message to give them. And he says this, um, after recounting all that they'd gone through with God, he says, Now, in verse 14, Now therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord... Choose you this day whom you will serve, 
whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, so famous passage. And this is a very important decision that everybody has to make. And again, it's simple, right? You serve God or you serve Satan. You serve the world or you serve the things of God, right? Spiritual things. Um, good or evil, right? Spirit or flesh. Very simple. As you walk through life, you either go right or left, right? You either go straight or you go crooked. These are, this is kind of the, the large choices that you make. Like you, everything you do kind of falls into that, okay? Um, and you know you have to make a choice. That choice has to be made. And that choice can't be made when something presents itself to you. You have to make it now, right? Joshua is saying here, choose you this day who you're going to serve. Um, in, in other words, before opportunities come or before these individual decisions come where you have to go right or left, you got to make a choice in your heart to say, okay, whatever may come, I'm going to choose today. So we all have to make a choice, and it's just between two things, right? Good or evil, God or devil. Uh, and you got to make that choice today. Not tomorrow, not next week, because you know what? Between now and the time that you make the choice, you're going to mess up, and it's going to hurt you. And, and you know what? That sometimes when you start making the wrong decisions, um, that leads you down a path where you, th you thought you were going to make the choice next week, and you're 10 years down the line, you know, and you're, you're further than you've ever been. So that's kind of where we ended, right? And a simple choice that you have to make today. Are you going to do good or are you going to do evil? You're going to serve God or you're going to serve the devil. But today, let's go a step further. Now that you've made that choice, and Paul asks this question that I'm going to ask you very, um, he made the point very uh, sharply, right, in Romans chapter 7, but how to do that which is good? And he says, I, I know not. Right? In other words, it, it's not so easy, you know. Um, it's not so simple to face some of the situations that you're going to face in life. Okay, um, let me give you some examples. Okay, Let, let's think about it. First example, you notice that your spouse is unusually irritable, snappy or like depressed or something, right? You just notice that. And I'm sure that never happens, but no, okay? Or maybe you're the one that, feel, you're the spouse, maybe you're the spouse that feels that way. You know, like, oh, just, just snappy, irritable, like the world's against me and my wife slash husband's against me. Or maybe it's your kids. Maybe if you're a kid, it's your, your siblings that are this way. Well, let me ask you a question. What should you do? You've already decided you're going to do the right thing, right? What's the right thing? Well, you could pray, yeah. Um, do, you, do you say something? Well, if you say something, then what do you say? And if... You know what to say, then when do you say it? Do you say it in front of your family? Is it a public thing? Do you make it private? Do you wait? Do you say it right away when you notice? These are real questions. These are real questions, and it's different for every situation. There's no cookie-cutter script you can follow to do good in real-life situations, right? But God expects us to be able to do good in these everyday, intimate scenarios. Okay, example number two. You're at a coffee shop. You're having a casual conversation with somebody that you don't, as a stranger, okay? And you're just talking about like, yeah, my favorite drink is this. How was your day? The weather's crazy. And then as you're talking, he starts going off about like, yeah, man, I've been reducing my carbon footprint. And I just love Mother Earth and da-da-da-da-da. And he kind of goes off in that direction. How do you respond? Well, that's a rhetorical question. I'm just trying to get you to think, right? How do you respond? Is it, is it, you know, but there's a variety of ways to respond. There's a way that Bob might want to respond, uh, but what's the right thing to do there? You, you've already decided that you're going to handle everything in your life God's way, but in that particular situation, what is God's way? Amen. Well, it takes some wisdom, doesn't it? It takes some thinking. Depends on that person, depends on how the Spirit leads, depends on your knowledge of the Bible and how it tells you, right? Sometimes you answer a fool according to his folly. Sometimes you answer not a fool according to his folly. Yeah, it can be kind of hard. It's not so simple at times. Third example. This one that, that you know, I know uh, um, from working at Starbucks. So you, let's say you start a new job at Starbucks, okay? Well, Leah's going to school soon. Let's say she gets a job at the campus Starbucks. Your boss tells you, hey, 
Every employee gets one free drink. You mark it out on the, on the register. You have an eight hour shift or a four hour shift, doesn't matter. You get one free drink, you mark it out. And then you go up, you show up for your second shift once you get the job and boss is not there and everybody is just making multiple drinks, giving it out to their friends, oh. eating pastries. Oh. Th that's what we did. You know, when I was lost, that's what we did at our Starbucks. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is a little confession moment. Um, okay, but you're a Christian, and you've made the choice to do what's right. So what's the right thing to do? It's not obvious, right? You have to really think. Do you, do you tell on him right away? Do you walk up to him, you, you confront them? How do you confront them? Angrily? Nicely? Right? It's different. There's different scenarios that are appropriate for different situations. It's not that simple. You have to think. You have to learn. You have to be wise. Does that make sense? Okay. So, look, these kinds of decisions, right, they look small. Like, these examples are small examples, right? Like the, the your spouse is cranky example. Seems small. Seems inconsequential. Seems like something you might not put too much thought into. Uh, but they're not really that small. They're not really as simple as we think they are. They're really not. You know, what you do, what you say, what you even what you think, in response to all of these tiny things that come up during your everyday life, you know, they build up and that is who you are. That is what your life is. God's not going to judge you based on circumstances you couldn't control, but God is going to judge you on how you handle every little, you know what the Bible says? Jesus said, um, God's going to judge, you know, take account, right? Of every idle word that men utter out of their mouth, every idle word. You think it's idle, but to God, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to take an account of that. I'm going to ask you why you said that one word, or you said it that way, or you know, even these tiny little situations, because they're not so small. It's not that often for you to face big decisions in life. It's, it's not. I mean, you have seasons where everything piles on top of each other. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I get that. Yeah, you, you do, and we have seasons. But, you know, overall, if you just take your whole life, especially in America in 2023, Kind of in the area that we're at which is crazy as it is we're not in downtown la we're not in skid row we're not in portland seattle you know it, it's you have a lot of small decisions to make and only a few big decisions and so really a majority of your opportunities to do right is found in these little decisions and they build up you know it's not like one day everything's going right and then your wife leaves you right it's not like that. It's these tiny things when you notice that she's a little cranky and you just don't think about how you respond to it. And it's, it's you know, these are little cracks that appear, right? Every time you kind of gloss over these little things, every time you gloss over something wrong at work, something wrong in a relationship, right? Something wrong in your school, I don't know, in your family, whatever, right? At church. These are little cracks and you don't even know they're happening and then one day everything shatters and you go, what happened? It was these little things. It's these little things, okay? And so what we need and what we all need, now that we've made the choice, and I hope if you haven't made the choice to serve God, the Bible says make it today, okay? So make it today. But if you've made that choice, then you need wisdom. And you need wisdom to get you through all of these decisions that you face because these are all opportunities and they're also dangers. They're opportunities for blessings. You know, like, I've really seen that in my life, in my job and in my career. Um, I'm an attorney, and I work cases, and, you know, I navigate through cases, and it's really all about just making small decisions, small decisions, small decisions. What do I say? When do I say it? Who do I say it to? And when I do it right, it builds into an outcome that's good. Amen. And I've seen that even one email that I was just kind of, careless about it just creates a whole cascade of problems and then i have to do more work to solve it mm -hmm. you know and that's just the little picture of our whole lives and we need wisdom to get us through it we need it desperately we need it a lot more than we think we do yeah. okay so before we move on let's let's clear up a couple things i want to make two quick points about wisdom. Easy to grasp, but at the same time, it's kind of mysterious, right? It's like, what is it really? What's, what is wisdom? Right, and so you could say it's the fear of the Lord, which is true. 
And you can say it's Christ. Christ is the wisdom of God. It's true. Uh, but, you know, you need to understand wisdom in a practical level. Because you're going to face practical problems that you need to face as a Christian. And then just sitting there and saying, ah, fear the Lord, fear the Lord, fear the Lord. That's not going to help you. So you need a deeper understanding. So first, let's talk about the definition of wisdom in a way that's, that I hope that will help you actually use it in your life in, in a very simple way, right? First of all, wisdom is not intelligence. Right? You're right. Wisdom is not intelligence. Some of the smartest people on television and on YouTube writing books and our celebrities, they're absolute fools. Okay? Some of the smartest people in your personal lives are absolute fools. And some people that don't, you know, just straight up there, they don't have high IQs, they're extremely wise. They're just extremely wise. They just know what they're doing and they seem to know how to progress through life in a wise way, right? So it's not intelligence. You know, intelligence is, it, it's like any other ability. It's like height. It's just something that God gives you and you just have, everybody has their measure, right? Just like everybody has a measure of height, health, speed, strength, money, just a measure. Hey, but wisdom is different. Wisdom is something that's available to all of you. Every single person, it's available, okay? So here's my definition of wisdom that hopefully will help you. Wisdom is a, the skillful use of the ability that God gave you. Okay, so you might have different levels of abilities, but wisdom is, you, wisdom takes all of the abilities you have and then uses it correctly. So you get the maximum effect, right? You get the, it's, it's efficient, it's effective, it's practical. And the best picture of that I can show you is found in Ecclesiastes. So let's turn there. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. To me, this is the verse that really tells me, like, here is a practical understanding of what wisdom is. And when you get to Ecclesiastes in chapter 10, let's look at verse 10. And the Bible says this, and this is Solomon writing. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge. Now, when you see wet there with the WH, that's not water. That's sharpening, right? That's a, you take a stone and you sharpen the edge of a knife, a sword, an axe, whatever. So you have a piece of iron. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Okay? So think about that. It's a chunk of iron, and if you don't sharpen it, and you try to use it to cut something down, it's going to take you a lot of effort. It's going to be a lot harder than using something sharp. Think of an axe. It's got a blade, right? It's got a piece of metal, and there's a sharp edge, and you just drive that edge into the wood. And the sharper it is, the easier it is to get the wood, right? And cut into the wood. But imagine it's blunt. Like, imagine you have a hammer, and you got a tree, and you're just smacking it over, and you know, eventually you'll get it down, all right? It won't be <laughs> very pretty, probably won't be usable in any real sense, uh, but, and it's going to take forever, right? And you're going to be exhausted, okay? But wisdom is profitable to direct. You know what the edge does? You got a piece of iron, it's a very strong material, but without an edge, there's no direction to it. You can take all that weight in that head of the axe, right? The iron ahead of the axe, and the wisdom is the edge that directs all of the force into one spot, right? Yeah, so that's wisdom, right? Wisdom is the thing that directs all of your abilities to its maximum potential, okay? And some of you have a hard time in life because you don't have wisdom. You understand what I'm saying? Because you have the ability, you have everything. God has given you everything you need to live the life you need to live, but you lack wisdom. So you're like an ax that's blunt and you have all this force and you have all this strength, but you're trying to chop down a tree and there's no edge, right? Everything is harder in life if you don't have wisdom, but that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is the thing that directs you, right? Directs all your abilities. It focuses you into one point and then you can be effective, right? It makes effective use of what you have. So that's the definition of wisdom. And here's a quick note on the duality of wisdom. And duality just means that there's two op opposite 
sides to it. So there's good wisdom and there's bad wisdom. I don't want to spend too much time on it because I have actual points I want to make. Um, but we need to know that, that not all wisdom is good. There is, you know, all wisdom is effective. Okay, that's the tricky part is there's good wisdom and there's evil wisdom. And evil wisdom is actually very, very, very effective. You know, lost people, some lost people have a lot of wisdom. Okay, they know how to take the skills that they have and then use it effectively to achieve their goals. But the goals are wrong. And the goals are evil. And the goals are selfish. And they're greedy. And they work sorrow and suffering and pain. And it's, it's just about them. Right? right? But it's still wisdom. The Bible, the Bible calls it that. The devil is wise. Thou art wiser than Daniel. Yeah. It doesn't say thou wert wiser than Daniel. It's just thou art wiser than Daniel. You're, you're wiser than Daniel. Satan, you're just directing all of your abilities the wrong direction to do the wrong things. And um, I think I'll skip this next part for sake of time. But you guys remember there's a man named Ahithophel in the Bible. Ahithophel. He was a counselor. You want to read about him, he's in 2 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. He was the grandpa, I think, of uh, Bathsheba. Yeah, and he was David's counselor. So he advised David. And David knew how smart and how actually how wise Ahithophel was. And apparently this man had a grudge because David, you know, dishonored his granddaughter. And Ahithophel turned on David. Okay, he turned on David. When David's son Absalom rebelled against David, Ahithophel, he became Absalom's counselor. And he gave him some extremely wise advice. See, for example, he told Absalom when he got into the capital and David was driven out, he says, okay, your dad left 10 of his concubines. You need to make them yours and you need to do it publicly. And that way, the rest of the nation has to pick a side. And everybody understands that there's, there's no reconciliation. There's no halfway point. They need to be with you or they're against you. So it was a very wise counsel. It divided the whole nation, you know, very strongly in two. And that strengthened Absalom because at that point, he only had a few hundred supporters. And so that was very good counsel. And the Bible calls it out. He's, you know what the Bible says about Ahithophel while he's giving Absalom advice against david it says his counsel in those days it was like you inquired at the oracle of god so he had wisdom he had wisdom okay um it's just the wrong direction and he gave you know he gave absalom some other good advice but god stopped that and he went and hung himself you know why because he's wise he knew like oh okay it's over for me <laughs> you know i'm giving the right advice and god's stopping it so you know, way before the rebellion is actually, you know, at the height of the rebellion, basically, Ahithophel has the wisdom to look at it. And when his counsel is ignored, he basically says, oh, we're going to lose. So I'm going to just go hang myself. That's what he does. Um, so that's misused wisdom. But there's a duality of wisdom. So just know that there's good and evil. So definition of wisdom. Wisdom is the thing that directs you and makes you effective, makes use of your abilities. And there's a good and an evil wisdom. So with that in mind, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 1. I just have a few simple points today. It's not complicated. It's very important. And I think um, wisdom is something that we take lightly as Christians. Um, I think the, uh, you know, every kind of type of, because there's a lot of different type of Christians, right? I mean, let's just take all the saved Christians in the world today, or in America today. So you got the charismatics, you got the, you know, the really scholarly crowd, like the Calvinists and the Lutherans and stuff like that. And you got, you know, they all have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to us, we have a couple weaknesses as Bible believers, and that is sometimes we just make things too simple. We don't take wisdom, you know, we take it lightly. We take the wisdom lightly. We kind of think that Christianity is about yelling and passing out tracts and, and just seeing souls saved and, you know, like just the really like emotional, deep kind of spiritual experience, but it's not. There's actually a lot of thinking involved. Mm -hmm. Christianity is a thinking religion. God wants us to think. God wants us to grow in wisdom. He wants us to have subtlety. That's surprising because usually when you hear about subtlety in the Bible, it's bad. 
First time you hear about it, it's the devil. Yeah. Devil's subtle. Uh, next time you hear about it, it's an evil guy um, causing all sorts of division. Um, but, you know, here in the Proverbs, let's look at chapter 1. And so I'm going to make the first point here. And the first point today is the need for wisdom. You need wisdom. You need wisdom. You need it. It's not an option. It's not, it's not an optional thing that you can add on to your life. You need it in your life. And you need it desperately. And let me, if I rephrase that, it's not good to be simple. It's not. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Proverbs, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Here's why the book was written. And God wrote this book. Solomon wrote it, but God really wrote it, right? Through Solomon. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple. So God says, look, if you're simple, you need subtlety. Okay, it's not, don't stay simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. So you need knowledge and discretion. And although the whole Bible will give that to you, there is a book here a portion of the book that's written specifically for that purpose. So he says, you read what I wrote here, and you're a simple person, you're going to get some subtlety. You're going to get some knowledge. You're going to get some discretion. Very important discretion, right? Very important. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. Oh, so it's not just for people without wisdom. It's for people that have already gained wisdom to gain even more wisdom. So you're simple, read the Proverbs, get some wisdom. Now that you're wise, guess what? Go back to the Proverbs and get more understanding. To understand, a man and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand the proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now, this book will give you all of that. That's what these verses are saying. But the implication is you need all of that. It's here because you need it. You get it? Yeah. So it's not good to be simple. You know what Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospels when he sends them out, right? He sends them out two by two and he does, you know, go and preach the kingdom of heaven and da 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 You know, don't, don't take a purse, don't take a, you know, just bring a staff, don't even bring a coat, just, just like your basic stuff. God will provide you everything you need, but I send you as sheep among wolves. So be harmless as doves. And as wise as serpents. So he says, you don't need your purse. You don't need to bring a weapon. You don't need to bring really just wear your sandals and your clothes. God will provide you everything, but bring your wits. Bring your wisdom. Bring your mind with you. Pay attention. Think your way through the ministry. I'll provide you everything that you need, but you need to still think about what you're doing. So it's subtle, right? It's wise as serpents. Serpents are subtle. You know? And Christians need to be subtle. We, we just aren't sometimes. And, and we, when we're not subtle, we think we're being spiritual. And that's kind of a, you know, that's a shame. Because honestly, Christians should be the wisest people on earth. They really should be. We, sh we have access to wisdom far greater than anybody else in the world. Okay? You turn to Romans 16. Let me just uh, drive the point home a little bit more. Romans chapter 16, you need wisdom, and it is not good for us to be simple. It's not good for Christians to be simple. You're not going to be an effective Christian for too long if you stay simple. You can start simple. Hey, we all start out stupid. Really, in, in God's eyes, right? Like, no matter how smart you were before you got saved, once you get saved, you're a baby. Yeah, we're simple, and that's okay, but you don't stay simple. You got to progress. You got to grow in wisdom. Look at verse, uh, Romans chapter 16, look at verse 17. And Paul says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, Christian, I beseech you, Christian, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For your obedience, uh, for they that are such, so these are the, you know, mark them, right? They that are such. Serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why Paul has to say that is because they look like they're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand? Otherwise, he doesn't have to call it out. 
For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of who? The simple. Yeah, you're simple. You're simple Christian. Guess what? You're going to get deceived. You're going to get deceived. For your obedience, this is, here's the amazing part here, right? Look, just let, I'm going to make the connection for you, but think about how verse 18 and 19 are related, okay? He says, hey, uh, here's some people that are going to, that are not serving God. They look like it on the outside. They're not serving God. They're after you, and they're after the simple among you. And then he says, for your obedience is come abroad unto all men. Hey, you guys are great Christians. You guys obey the gospel. You guys obey God. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. So I'm really glad. Paul says, I'm really glad you guys are faithful. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're obeying God. But, see that word, but, yet I would have you wise unto that which is good. That's missing. That's something that's missing in these Christians' lives. And he says, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Okay, so let's take a few lessons from this passage, okay? Let's start with the, the, the they, okay? Let's, let's start with the they. Uh, mark them, right? For they that are such. So here are some tempters and deceivers that are specifically targeting Christians, okay? Number one, they use wisdom. These guys, these tempters, they use wisdom to derail Christians, yeah. right? Take you off the right path. Number two, the way they do it, by causing divisions and infightings. And Jesus said, by their fruits, you shall know them. Yeah. So some guy comes in here and, and he looks like a really good Christian. He has all the right doctrine and he speaks really well. And, and you, know, you can't really tell the difference at first, but you look at his fruit. He stays here for a few months and he seems to be at the center of infighting and divisions. Guess what? He's one of they. Yeah. Okay, so how do they cause divisions and infightings? Through good words and fair speeches, right? Okay, and then finally, what are they motivated by? Selfish and carnal desires. Yeah. Selfish, carnal, they just, they'll make a gain out of you. You know, they'll, they'll, you know, these are the guys that'll cause a division and then he'll take some away and then now they're tithing to him, yeah. right? Or maybe they're respecting him. Maybe he doesn't want the money, he just wants the status. Maybe he just wants some people following him. You know, bowing to him, kowtowing to him, right? So selfish, carnal desire. So these are they, right? Well, they, they speak very well. They use good words. I mean, you read this and you think, well, you know, you imagine that they're going to come in here and start spewing hateful things. But that they, good words, fair speeches. It's going to sound good. It's going to sound nice. And they probably, you know, I mean, Dr. Ruckman's the opposite of that, right? Yeah. You know, what he says is good, but sometimes he says it in a way where it's like, well, it could be a little nicer, you know? Uh, but these guys are the opposite. What they're actually saying is, is really evil, but you're not going to know it by listening to them. But now look at the people they're targeting, okay? He says, no, Paul says, I beseech. And that's begging. You know why he's begging? Because it's dangerous. Because it's a real and clear and serious danger for Christians to be deceived. And specifically, Christians that are faithful but simple. That's the people he's talking to. You're faithful, you're obedient, and I praise you for it, but you are not wise. And therefore, you're vulnerable. You're not protected against these deceivers. Okay, so what do I learn from that? Well, simply following Christian instructions doesn't protect you from deception. And that's what simple but faithful Christians are. They, they, they only go so far in their Christianity. They just do what they're taught is right, and the instructions are right, but there's no deep understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing it. Right? And you need wisdom regarding the good. He says, be wise. You know, be wise unto good, right? He says, uh, what is the right, what's the word here? Um, Yet I would have you wise unto that which is good. You know, that tells me right here that in order for you to do good, you need some wisdom. You need wisdom to do good. It's not always so obvious what the right thing is. It's not always obvious what you should say to your wife when she is cranky. Because you could, well, no, look, seriously. 
Because it could be any number of things. It could be something you're doing. It could be something she's going through at work. It could be, you know, so many things and you don't know, right? And so you have to be wise about how you approach that, when you approach that. But here's the next part, okay? A deep understanding of evil does not benefit you. It does not benefit you. He says, be simple concerning evil. And we're really bad about that. Because there's something really interesting about evil. There is, right? You could, you could spend a lot of time studying up on evil and how evil people do things and how, you know, the, the exact ways that Calvinists reason their whole wrong doctrine and, you know, you know, the history of the Nazis and, right? I mean, you could get real sucked into that and you can be very wise onto how the evil do their evil things. Yeah. But does that protect you from deception? No. Does, does Paul say you should be wise about it? No. He says you need to be wise about things that are good. How to do good. That's what you need to study. That's what you need to pray about. That's what you need to desperately beg God. God, give me wisdom so I can understand how to do good. Amen. And be simple about evil. You, should, you know, when you want to spot a counterfeit, you should know what the real thing looks like. Because the counterfeit is always morphing and evolving and changing. And so you can memorize, you know, a hundred different fake hundred dollar bills. But guess what? Within a year, there's another hundred variations. You can understand Calvinism very deeply. But guess what? Next year, there's a new form of Calvinism. And you're not going to know how to spot it. And you're not going to know how to argue against it. But you know what? If you just know whosoever will... You know, you're wise unto good. If you just understand that God wants you to have free will and how important it is and that Christ died for every man, if you know if you're wise unto the good, the true, the right, Calvinism is not going to get you. You don't, need to, you don't need to be able to understand what they're saying. You just need to know, hey, I know what the Bible, I know the truth. I'm wise unto the good. And that allows you to mark them and avoid them, not approach them, not argue with them, mark them, and avoid them. You get it? It's not good to be simple. We need wisdom. And we need wisdom to do good. Alright, let's go back to uh, Proverbs 1. So that's point one. The need for wisdom. We need wisdom. It's really not good to be simple. And you know, here's the other reason why we need it. Why we desperately need wisdom. Okay, look at Proverbs chapter 1. And we'll read... Uh, Verse 10, go down to verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My s there you go. Oh, yeah. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in sight of any bird. I love that verse. You know, so you, you can just picture some evil people laying a trap. And they're hiding it, right? And they're like, oh, yes. And, you know, God's watching. And, and God's like, I can see what you're doing. <laughs> I can see what you're doing, you know? In, in vain, surely in vain, the net is spread. And the bird's watching. They can see what you're doing. And they lay waited for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. So here's the thing, right? If sinners entice thee. Well, we're being enticed yeah. every day of our lives, sure. everywhere we go. Anytime you open your computer, you open your, your uh, phone, right? put up your phone, you drive past the billboard, you walk into a store, bookstore, grocery store, whatever. Yeah. You go into your job and your boss tells you stuff. You go to school and your friends tell you stuff. And they're all of the world. They don't have God. They don't have Christ. Even some saved people, you go into a church 
And they'll give you the wrong wisdom. They'll entice you. Yeah. And it won't, you know, the Bible reveals things and makes it clear uh, that are actually very difficult to tell without the Bible, right? In other words, when you read the passage here, you're like, well, why would I ever go with people that are laying the net in the side of the bird and they're, they're trying to kill and gain and they're greedy and they're evil? Why would I even follow them? Like, why would I even be enticed? Because outside of the Bible, it's painted over. It looks nice. It looks good. You don't even know. Your tax guy tells you, hey, here's how you can avoid paying taxes. Like all the time, I'll reduce your taxes, right? He's enticing you because he might be enticing you. He might be. Because you know what? Maybe he's going to do something a little dishonest. Maybe he's going to take some of your expenses that you should pay taxes on and say, hey, you know what? They'll never, they'll never audit you. They'll never find out. But that's not what the Bible says. Pay your taxes and be honest. Right? But he'll entice you. Right? Yeah. But he's not going to entice you like, like hey, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's lay and wait for the blood. You know, let's kill the innocent. He's not going to say that. But you know what? You cheating your taxes has an effect on the whole society. There's nothing you can, you really, there, there's nothing that you get for free in life. Okay, you think jaywalking across the street because it's too annoying to walk 10 feet down has no effect on anybody. You don't think it hurts people, but it does. Yeah. And you know what? You're going to have friends that are going to be like, hey, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? It, 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 we're going to get a gain out of it. We're going to save some time. You, you get what I'm saying? That's your life every day, everywhere you go. The Christian morality is so opposed to everything in this world that you're being enticed constantly and you desperately need wisdom. You need it now, you need it today, you need it tomorrow, you need it the day after. It, it's not optional. And, and look, it, it, we desperately need it because it, you know who it hurts first when you fail to exercise wisdom? The person that hurts the most is you. You have to remember, you, we have an enemy. We have an enemy that hates you more than, than you can even imagine. You really, you, you don't get it. How much the devil wants to ruin your life. And, and how much effort he is willing to put in to get you yeah. to ruin your life. Yeah. And to destroy your marriage. And to turn your yeah. kids astray. And to just leave you drinking and half naked on the streets. Yeah. Crazy. He would love that. He would and he would love to take, especially would love to take, church going Bible reading saved Christians and... and just run them through the grinder. He would love to do that. And the thing that will stop him in part, right? I mean, there's a lot of things, right? Submission to God, the, the prayer, church, Bible. But, you know, you need wisdom. Because the way he's going to do it is he's going to get you to slip up on these little decisions, right? These little decisions. You'll be great to your wife on Valentine's Day. But he'll get you to be short with her the rest of the year. And then now your marriage is done. And now your kids are bitter. Now you're out of church. You, you, you understand? I'm not exaggerating. This is how it works. Yeah. Things don't just happen like that. Very few things just happen yeah. like that. You don't just get sick one day and then go, the devil attacked me. Yeah. You didn't take care of your body. Because you didn't realize that that body belongs to God. And you didn't apply wisdom to taking care of what you eat and what yeah. you do. Yeah. Okay, these little things that you do. Do you understand? We desperately need it. Amen. We need it. We need it. We need it. It's not good to be simple. It is not good to be simple. Okay. So I think that's enough of that. All right. Point number two. I hope I've convinced you. that I hope I want make you want some wisdom. I really need some wisdom. Okay. Uh, point number two. Uh, the availability of wisdom. Wisdom is available to everybody. All of you. God, in fact... God wants to give you. He's like, he's got a lot of wisdom that he just wants to throw on you. just wants to make you wise. And the problem is we just don't ask. We just don't want it. Okay. It's your choice to stay simple. Or if I'm more blunt, it's our choice to stay stupid. If we stay stupid in life, that's our choice. We're choosing that. We'll look at Proverbs 1 verse 20. Wisdom crieth without. Loud voice. If this was pastor, he would yell, but I'm not a yeller. Yeah. <laughs> Wisdom crieth without. She's yelling outside. Like you street preach, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But wisdom, God's wisdom is yelling at you. Anytime you're facing some decision, it's yelling at you like, hey, this is what you should do. Do it this way. Okay? 
She uttereth her voice in the streets. It's not hiding it. It's not hidden. It's not in a corner. It's not in a house. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In other words, the picture is that someone goes to a place purposefully where people are going to be. And then she speaks, right? It's easy. It's available. It's public. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit onto you. I will make known my words unto you. I will make my words known unto you. God says, hey, you want some wisdom? It's right there. Man, you want to know how to treat your friends, how to go through your life at your job, how to navigate your marriage? right? How to deal with the brethren at church, how to serve God here, how to serve God there, how to talk to the lost person, how to minister to this guy, this person, this lady, whoever. I'm right there. I will tell you what you need to do. I'll give you the wisdom you need. Okay? It's your choice to hear it. So why, so why are we so stupid most of the time? <laughs> why is it? You know, it's your choice. Here's some reasons that we get here for why we reject wisdom. Because we do so many times, right? Um, Number one, you love being stupid. You love it. We do. Our flesh loves it. It's what it says, right? Hey, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? You actually like being simple. It's easier, you know? And, and it's better for your flesh. It's, a little, it's more selfish, you know? Because the wisdom that tells me, you know, the wisdom that tells me I should pay everything that I need to pay on my taxes, I don't love that because, you know what? I, I love having more money in my bank account. It's true, right? Yeah. I like having more money in my bank account. The wisdom that tells me that I should walk down the street and use the crosswalk, right? I, I like not having to do that because I'm here and the restaurant's there. And I don't want to do this. I don't, okay? Um, so I love, dude, there's a part of me that loves that simplicity, that stupidity, okay? Um, somebody does you wrong right? Your wife, your husband, your friend. I, I'm sorry, I keep saying, you know, the reason why I keep using that is I, I, there's just been a few broken marriages that I've been ministering to lately, and it's just in my heart, you know, and it's the saddest thing. It's just the saddest thing. Well, yeah, let's say, you know, you're, you're let's say, um, I'm a man, so I'll just say your wife does something wrong, okay, and she hurts you, and she's clearly wrong. You, husbands, you, your flesh loves to take that occasion to punish her and to lord over her and, and take out all the bitterness that you've had, all the annoying things that she's been doing and you've been patient and then like, oh, she messed up. Oh, let's go. Let's go. You, you, there's a part of your flesh loves it. And that's why when God's telling you, be gracious, be patient, be sacrificial, you go, no. Because I love yelling. I love feeling like I'm on the moral high ground. I love the feeling of dominion. See, I like that. Okay? You delight in your scorning. That's what it says. Verse 20. How long, you simple ones? I'm sorry, 20, 22. Will ye love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning? We delight in that sometimes. We really, the flesh is evil. You have to understand you live in an evil flesh. And sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference between your flesh and, and your spirit, which is who you really are. And, and, and we delight and we have to admit that we just the bible wants you to know that look there's a part of you that loves stupidity that that delights in scorning i mean who doesn't like railing on homosexuals if you're a bible believer but you shouldn't because the bible says don't respond to railing with railing contrary wise with blessing right okay but there's a part of us that really like it right there's a part of us that really like to talk a lot of smack about politicians. They deserve it. But we ought to be gracious. You know, can a, can a fountain, right? Can one fountain spew out salt water and sweet? Let, let your speech always be with grace. Is there an exception to that? No. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Is there an exception to that? No. Love your enemies. Except when, no, right? Okay, but we did, look, scorning's fun. I, really, I was the biggest scorner before I got saved. And God had to really get that out of me. And I'm still working on it. 
okay? Every time somebody does something stupid and cuts me off and I almost get in a crash, you know, I immediately, I go, Lord, you see that? That guy's so stupid. Like, what? Can't you see, like, it just hurts everything? And I just go, okay, I have to stop myself because I really like it, okay? But, the, but, it's, but that's why we don't listen to wisdom. That's why we turn wisdom off. You like your stupidity. You lo we like our simplicity. The reasons why we stay stupid, you love being simple, you delight in your scorning, and therefore you hate knowledge. Because that knowledge convicts you. And, and you feel justified in it. Really, that's the hardest thing when you feel justified. And, and, and you know, that's the hard part about the Bible. It's happy are you when you suffer for righteousness sake. Because you are justified sometimes in scorning in, 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 under the law, right? Under the law, you are on the moral high ground. When your wife messes up, husbands, and you didn't do anything wrong, she just messed up, you are on the moral high ground. But look, it's still wrong. And the Bible will convict you. And it forces you to change. And it forces you to give up these things, your, these behaviors, these thought patterns, um, these speeches that you really enjoy. And it's kind of become part of your life and part of your personality. But God doesn't want it to be a part of your personality. Because it's, it's not good. And it's stupid. It's simple. It's the wisdom of the world. And it will cause problems in your life. It will cause friction in your marriage and your relationships. It will cause divisions. You know, people don't just... You, and I'm a personal injury attorney, so I've been really thinking a lot about this, and I study accidents and stuff, and, and I drive a lot, and I watch people. Look, you don't just get into an accident one day. Sometimes, once in a while, you're totally fine. You're doing everything you're supposed to, and a drunk driver comes out of nowhere and hits you. But you know what? Every time somebody cuts you off and you respond that way, and you think that there's no consequence to that, Okay? But that becomes a pattern. And one day you go, and then, why, God, why did this happen? The devil popped my tie. No, 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 no. It's not how it works. Not how it works. Look, if something bad were to happen to me, and it could happen if I were to get sick, you know, I at least want the peace that comes from, you know what, God? I was doing everything right. Don't you want that? Bad things happen in life. If I get sick, I want to say, okay, God, you know, I didn't abuse my body. I was trying my best to eat, right? You know, you always... There's no perfection, but I was trying. I was mindful and was, I had the right heart. If I get hit by a drunk driver, at least I want to say, you know what? I was yielding. I was driving defensively. I was letting people go. I didn't have hate in my heart for any of these idiots. Um, see? See? It just creeps in. <laughs> that's, the, that's the flesh, you know? But I, at least I want a clean conscience, you know? And, and, and I wonder how much... Only God knows how much of the things that we go through truly yeah. are things that we engineered ourselves yeah. and we don't even know it. Uh, but God is merciful, okay? He won't, he won't beat you up over it. But we, he does want you to know it and acknowledge yeah. it yeah. and consider it, okay? Because there is, you know, and, and on that point, right, the consequence of rejecting wisdom. And we constantly reject it. And that's my last point, the vengeance of wisdom, okay? The vengeance of of wisdom. In other words, you will pay a price for staying stupid. You will pay a price. It's coming. If you won't fix your ways, if you won't wise up and God gives you grace after grace after grace and you just won't do it, guess what, Samson? One day your hair's cut off and your eyes are pulled out and you're grinding wheat and chains because God will not be mocked. Whatsoever you sow to the flesh, you reap of the flesh corruption. We got Proverbs 1, verse 24 to 33. We're just going to read the rest of the chapter. So here's wisdom, because I have called, I gave you a chance, and you refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded, but you have said it not, all my counsel. In other words, you know, you knew what the right thing was, and you said, nah, I'm not going to do that. I don't think that makes sense. No, 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 that can't be right. That can't be right. No, I deserve this. No, they deserve this. More like, right? And would none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Look, yeah, I know some brothers going through a rough time right now. And, and they've got a real good attitude about it. And they're growing through it. But there's some real anguish in knowing that I caused a big problem in my life. And things are never going to be the same again. Yeah. Things are never going to be the same again. There's a lot of distress and anguish there. You can't turn the clock back. You can't. 
Then shall they call upon me, but I shall not answer. It's too late for you to wait until some big crisis point comes and then says, oh, now I need some wisdom. Well, okay, God will give it to you, but it's not going to fix all the problems and the hurt that you've already caused. Okay? It's there. You have to deal with it. God is gracious. He'll give you another chance, but you still reap that corruption. It's too late. You need to make that. You know, Joshua said, choose today, right? Yeah, yeah and that applies here too. You got to choose today. Look, I need wisdom now for the problems that are coming tomorrow. I need wisdom now for the problems that I don't know are ahead. You could wake up tomorrow and have, you're going to have problems. I almost said you might, but you're going to have problems. So you need to ask God now. You need to seek it now. And you need to, you just constantly need to grow in wisdom, always seeking it. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. So you look, how, look how your attitude changes. Well, you didn't care about God's wisdom when things looked good. But now things are falling apart. Now you wake up early to seek God's wisdom. For, they, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. They would not of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Prosperity of fools. So for a while, things might be great. You might be fooled into thinking that things are going wonderful, but it's not. It's not that you're deceived by it. You're deceived by God's patience. You're deceived by God's mercy and grace sometimes into thinking things are fine. And you know, God has a lot of grace if you're doing wrong and you admit it and you know it and you're really trying. But the moment you say, well, I think things are fine. I don't think I need to change that. You know what? I'm just going to do this thing from now. I'm done fighting. I mean, God's just going to put up with it from now on better be careful if you get to that point because then something's coming I guarantee yeah. you because God loves you and he's not going to let you stay in that state he is going to wake you up and it's not going to be pleasant my dad used to you know my, my dad's so funny um, he, he you know he, he really I was kind of a late I had a lot of problems as a kid I wasn't the best kid and he really tried okay he, my dad really tried to fix me up the best he can and one of the things he'd do is I'd stay up late playing video games and I'd want to sleep in and he would like sneak into my room and all of a sudden he'd turn all the lights on and he's like wake up bada, 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 bada. I'm just like no <laughs> no I just had three hours of sleep I don't can't you do it gently he's like no you know but sometimes God's wake-up call is not gonna be gentle it's gonna be sudden it's gonna be harsh you know, it's going to be a lot of light at once just to get you out of that darkness. So, you know, you don't want to wait. You don't want to wait until you think you need wisdom. It's already too late, right? You, you just need to know that I need wisdom now. I need it. Don't take little things lightly. All these little decisions build up to big situations, and you need a lot of wisdom. There's nothing too small that you shouldn't pray to God. I mean, really seriously pray to God. What should I do, Lord? What's the wise thing? And sometimes it comes easy. God will just tell you like that. Sometimes he'll make you pray about it for days and days and days before you get the answer. Um, it's just all part of the classroom of God, right? He's teaching you. Yeah, but you need to ask. You need to ask. You need to seek it. You need to seek it, okay? You know what Solomon, remember Solomon? In 2 Chronicles chapter 1, let's not go there, but you know Solomon, he became king. Um, and, you know, once he became king, he dealt with a lot of problems. Dealt with a lot of problems, right? You have a lot of responsibilities. But before he faced anything, he first asked God, hey, I need wisdom, Lord, because I know that's coming. I know that judgment is coming, and I'm going to need to rule these people. He didn't wait until the two ladies show up with one baby yeah. trying to split them in half. Um, he asked before. He knew something was coming. He was wise enough, even as a young person, to know, I am going to need a lot of wisdom, yeah. and I'm going to ask him right now. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, look, we all desperately need wisdom. Wisdom is available. And if you ignore God's wisdom and God's call to you to get wise... It's going to come at a great cost to you. But God will give it to you liberally. That's what James says. Okay? So choose today. Choose right now that you are going to be wise. That you're not going to take this life lightly. That you're going to be serious about everything that you do. Understanding that everything you do counts if you do it for the Lord. 
and you can brush your teeth for the glory of God, and you can eat food for the glory of God. Really, you can. You can drive from your house to your work for the glory of God. It's not, it really is not hard. I'm just trying to show you that it's important, but once you get into it, it's fun. It's easy. Once you get into it, once you make that commitment, it's fun. It's easy. Life is good when you let God's wisdom guide you. It really is. It really is. And it's really bad if you ignore it. So that's, that's it. So ask God. Amen. Choose today that you're going to be wise for God. And seek it. Start seeking it today. And don't stop until we get out of here.